Welcome everyone to the CILE Academy and this week's guest lecture for our human rights module. It is Professor Hilal Elver lecturing on the topic, why do we need the right to food? This session is scheduled to last, to last approximately 60 minutes with a lecture followed by a Q&A. Allow me to now hand you over to our moderator, the co-director of the E-Academy, Dr. Nilifa Oral. Thank you, Zue. Um, well, uh, the Academy uh, is delighted to have as our guest lecturer today, uh, a dear colleague, uh, Professor Hilal Elver, uh, who was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food from 2014 until 2020. Uh, she's research professor at University of California, Santa Barbara, um, also a distinguished global fellow at UCLA Law School, uh, the Resnick Food Law and Policy Center. Um, in the interest of time, I will not go through her entire CV, but I will add that she was a member of the climate change legal team for the Turkish delegation, and we worked together at that time. And I think one thing that we're all very proud of is that she was the founding legal advisor of the Ministry of Environment in Turkey between 1989 and 1991. Anyway, in the interest of time, I will stop here. It's my great pleasure uh, to turn over the floor to Professor Hilal Elver for her lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Nunefer. It, it's a, a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, newly established interesting academy. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased uh, to be included and in talking a little bit about the right to food, which uh, sometimes uh, not uh, well correctly understood. Sometimes in, in some countries actually not even uh, considered as a, a part of the human rights. So that's why I sort of put my uh, title of my question, why we need the right to food, why we need it. Of course, many of you are um, uh, students or participants in the academy, they must know that is the, one of the very fundamental rights of the economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, no question about it, but this uh, doesn't flow everywhere as uh, we want. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to do right now, because this uh, lecture is part of the practitioner's uh, uh, sort of uh, part or uh, what you call this section. So I'm trying to explain a little bit of my position as UN Human Rights uh, um, Council's uh, Special Rapporteur on Right to Food, because you would like to know how these procedures work, or maybe you already saw in um, in a general human rights lecture, but I, it's important for me to give a little bit of background idea or what would be the inside of uh, this work, how it looks, uh, because it's insider looks is different than the outsider looks. So this uh, special rapporteurship is part of the special procedure systems that Human Rights Council established other than the other systems. For instance, there's a, a also a, 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 the section that universal periodic reviews is happening. And there's on another section about uh, a convention, variety of the human rights convention. They all have a committees and special procedures are uh, independent experts were, uh, were uh, elected by uh, the Human Rights Council member countries uh, by consensus. Uh, saying that by consensus is of course very difficult um, to be selected by, uh, elected by consensus, but somehow um, states are making uh, compromising adjustments uh, because the consensus is really important according to, um, oh, my goodness, uh, according to, okay. sorry, I have a friend that wants to be part of the academy, very sophisticated cat. Let's go. So, uh, 
example. Uh, what, uh, as you know, maybe uh, very well, because you are uh, kind of uh, much more experienced uh, people, I looked at the list. Many of you work with the governments and with other institutions and Minister of Foreign Affairs. You know about the special procedure, you know about the special reporters, but the special reporters, as I said, independent experts, which they are not part of the UN civil servant system, they are not part of any state institution, and this job for um, six years, three terms, three years, three years, and without any salary, so we are totally independent, we don't have a boss, we can say anything we want, even though we can go against the uh, United Nations Secretary General and nobody can fire us. That's the kind of things that is important as a, a special uh, rapporteurship position because we are dealing with the human rights. Because we are dealing with the human rights, we have to be really outspoken, we have to be really independent, and we have to be also careful not to uh, make unjust uh, a kind of uh, comments about anyone else. That's also very important. We are criticizing um, kind of unusual or um, not very well made policies, but at the same time, we have to show, show that states are doing something good. So it's a kind of a give and take generally in our reports. So in this um, uh, position, I we always pick two countries in a year to go mission trips. And mission trips are very, very important because you go to the country, the country that you select, completely independently you select the country, and you go from the small village to the big office of the prime minister and academia, civil society, or we go you know, homes, in independent individuals home, we knock the doors and go in, uh, sit with the people to understand uh, how uh, the situation in relation to right to hood, what is the government policy, whether or not it's uh, acceptable, if there is a democratic system. So the mission trips are extremely important. Unfortunately, right now, because of the COVID-19, uh, as far as I know, there is no uh, mission uh, uh, trips right now. This is a very, very unfortunate. I hope it will come up. Uh, it will uh, start again. Uh, but I'm so also worried about because the budget issues in the Human Rights Council made these uh, trips a uh, much more difficult than used to be. So other than this uh, two uh, mission trips, uh, uh, the countries, which is I, I went 11 countries in this uh, job. And also we have every year we are preparing two thematic reports. Some special reporters are preparing one thematic, uh, uh, two thematic reports, but not the, uh, other than Geneva. They don't go to Geneva. In Right to Food is one of the oldest uh, 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 special reportership. So one... Uh, Every six months, we go to UN in New York uh, to uh, the uh, six, uh, third committee, and also we do present other thematic report in Geneva. Geneva is much more, of course, human rights friendly as has to be. So uh, we have interactive dialogues when we bring our reports, uh, thematic reports, and also mission reports. Only Geneva, not in New York, because New York only we produce, uh, introduce uh, thematic reports. In Geneva, for instance, when I sit uh, last time in March uh, 3rd, actually it was the last day they closed the United Nations. It was my last uh, report and the last day of the UN before uh, because of COVID. And I introduced three country reports because it's kind of put together Zimbabwe, Italy, and I really don't remember what was the last one, and, uh, and thematic reports. So um, it's, it's a quite a heavy, heavy workload job, but at the same time, you learn incredible amount of knowledge. And you have 
a very important power as a as your United Nations writer of the United Nations report. So uh, we sort of uh, prepare this policy uh, papers, which countries and NGOs sometimes countries don't take seriously, but always always NGOs take seriously. So that's why the, the structure of the uh, special procedure is important because we say something, we say something, and we uh, sort of establish future policies and behind us, civil societies, other special reporters, other international organizations, they follow. Sometimes countries follow. Not always, because countries are generally resistant from uh, several reasons. So this is the policy um, behind of the special reportership. So coming to the right to food, why we need a right to food? Uh, that's a uh, that's a of course a serious question. But what I did give to you two uh, documents. The one documents was um, in in two thousand. Five, 2015, so I'm sorry, I became special reporter 2014, and the UCLA Law School organized a big conference and uh, sort of explaining what is it means special reportership, what is my priorities, because every special reporter, when they start uh, their uh, period, they bring uh, their priorities and views and ideology, I ideologies uh, to expose what they, uh, what they are expecting from us. So in 2015, this uh, article is my first expression or uh, why my first impression about the special reportership. And the last, the second document is six years after a lot of experience, says 11 mission countries, 11 uh, thematic reports, hundreds of hundreds of meetings with governments, universities, NGOs, international organizations, much more, we become more expert at the end. That's a very interesting thing. So you are expert to be selected first, but at the end, after this huge experience, we really become a special uh, kind of independent expert. And you think you should be longer. No, certainly not longer. Nobody can sit in any position much longer than necessary because this makes uh, all of all of human beings are much more very a kind of confident to their ideas and they become less democratic more a kind of self-righteous. So that's a, the one reason it's important timing. The another one, it has to be a different region should be presented, not only Africa, not only Asia, not only Europe, but everywhere, every continent and every country should be represented or should be uh, given a priorities or opportunities to be part of the United United Nations family. And gender also is very important. The, uh, the woman and man have a different ideas, different perspectives, even though the principles and rules and everything same, but we see very differently. So it's very important to do the changes, to, uh, give, to make a new faces, uh, new policies in the area. So I think uh, I am trying to explain this because you are maybe part of this future UN uh, machinery. So you want to learn what they're expecting from you, how you have to act other than uh, international human rights law, economic, social, cultural rights, and right to food. So then come to the right to food, why it's so important. Uh, first of all, uh, the food security is, was a, is a very important subject since the UN established. So uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
even started this a kind of uh, important uh, section of the livelihood. So every human beings have to have a decent life in in their environment for themselves and for their families. So Universal Declaration of Human Rights makes clear you know, one of the rights is a fundamental right. But as you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights have no legally very you know, strong uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, implementation power. So then after the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, they decided to make a covenant. Mm -hmm. When they uh, thought about the covenants, one is the uh, civil and political rights, the other one's economic, social, and cultural rights. First, they thought this has to be one covenant and two different sets of the rights. But um, among the states, developing countries and developed countries, and during the Cold War period, the ideologies and standings are very different. So they decided, okay, now let's put the civil and political rights in one hand and then economic social rights on the other. So first uh, civil and political rights uh, covenant came and then 1966, they did the economic, social and cultural rights. So, but starting from the day first, what we see in the human rights area, politically, and academically, the civil and political rights become much more prominent because uh, the Western countries really supported this idea of the civil and political rights much strongly, stronger than the economic social rights. On the other hand, the countries in the South and the, during the Cold War period, Soviet uh, group of countries were very much in favor of the economic social and uh, cultural rights. So there, there is a, a, a not uh, completely equal uh, recognition in the human rights area. Even though in the Vienna 1993, I remember, I think 1993, this uh, uh, UN uh, Global Summit on Human Rights made clear that two covenants and two sets of rights is equal, but unfortunately implementation was not equal. Having said that, I was not able to get into the right to foot, I am sorry, but these are very important background information to understand. Um, unfortunate things is, despite all the economic development, despite all uh, kind of positive economic and uh, economic conditions around the world, we were not able to eliminate hunger and malnutrition and forget about eliminate hunger and malnutrition. And last four or five years, hunger and malnutrition is increasing. So what are we doing? Are we doing something wrong that we, despite all these rules and principles and plans and institutional organizations of the UN, we are not able to eliminate hunger? For instance, the last one is 2000, 2015 Sustainable Development Goals. One of the major goals was the zero hunger in 2030. No way we are even closer completely opposite uh, to any thirty, we will have a more hunger than right now. That's a very kind of uh, sad story. Unfortunately, international community was not able to solve this problem, was not even able to reduce the hunger. So then in the last few years, international organizations, uh, especially FAO, FAO is, as you know, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It's extremely strong, powerful, full organization is in Rome, you know, we have also we called Rome-based institutions. Rome-based institutions are, many of the food security institutions are in Rome. Like in Geneva, we know Geneva is a human rights center. We know New York is basically 
uh, security oriented because Security Council is there, much more political issues dealt in New York. In Rome, we have several of uh, organizations was established. The first is the FAO, and the, uh, there is IFAD. It's a, a more a kind of credit organization for agriculture development and World Food Program. I am sure you learned you heard about World Food Program recently because the World Food Program uh, uh, this year won uh, the uh, Peace uh, Nobel Peace Prizes, which is very very good decision because even the short period of time, uh, all the international community look at why World Food Program received that. Uh, uh, important peace prize. So that was the reason because recently there's a significant problem of not only increasing hunger, but increasing extreme hunger. Extreme hunger means uh, starvation and famine. So the international community was thinking about why and the work food program uh, is the first responder to go to places that under the serious emergency situation, mostly conflict and then natural disaster, now COVID-19. So when I was writing this, my reports, I never thought about it, COVID-19. Even in my last report, as you know, COVID-19 came after, we never thought that uh, there will be pandemic around the world, and this will affect significantly food security and the right to food. This is completely new thing. So the things are uh, changing uh, every year or every few, uh, few years. For instance, in 2007, there was a very important economic crisis in the world, and the 2007 economic crisis affects significantly food uh, prices in many of the developing countries and LDCs, least developed countries. There was a political strife, and actually many of the writers are now uh, dealing with the uh, Arab Spring, which is the earlier reasoning of the food insecurity in places that basically uh, they are not uh, food secure or they are not self-sufficient. So self-sufficiency for the developing countries are very important because if you are um, importing many of the significant foods for the people because of the economic crisis and other crises, you will not be able to do that. So there will be a serious kind of food availability issues. So that was the 2000. 2007, 2008. But when I became special reporter, mostly this um, uh, starvation and famine uh, become an important issue. When I started, I didn't understand this. When I uh, wrote this first article, for instance, I didn't mention too much about uh, starvation and uh, famine, but uh, this came after. And uh, so at the end of my time COVID came. So things are dramatically changing. What is not changing, respect to human rights. That's a very important thing. If we implement human rights principle properly, then we will be able to solve many of the issues, especially protection of the vulnerables. Because why we need the human rights concept. You can ask me, well, if we don't have a right to food in our constitution, but in our country, there is no hungry people. So, for instance, the United States is one example of that, right? United States basically established food security concept as opposed to right to food concept. Whenever international uh, meetings happening in relation to right to food, United Nations, United States always reserve. It's not the right to food, it's the food security. So uh, you see this uh, concept that you look at the, in the documents, well, meanings are very important. United States of America does not accept right to food because they don't want 
any uh, accountability system in relation to food policy. It's a federal, of course, that's uh, uh, you all know, federal system, that kind of issues, more likely state-oriented policies. And the United States does not want any kind of accountability in international level um, about uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. Food security means you, um, in order to make you make the policies in your own country to keep the people uh, kind of food secure in significant time. Good. That's a possibility. There are lots of policies many countries do uh, to no countries in the world uh, would like to have their citizens uh, starving. That's not the case. But the human rights principles makes the countries responsible what kind of policies, what kind of policies they are doing and whether or not this policy is just, equitable, non-discriminatory, and people are participate into the decision making, and when the uh, rights are violated, has to be just justice system, justiciability is a very important thing. So that's why we are promoting a human rights concept to uh, food security or human rights based approach. So that's, uh, I always, and all the special reporters, previous me and the, uh, later me, it's a very important to make clear distinction because right to food is not a charity. Many countries consider it as a charity, a charity issue, which means a lot of NGOs or even the governments can uh, go and help people hungry. But the right to food is not charity. Right to food is a legal entitlement, which means first, vulnerable the first. Who are the vulnerable? We can talk about it. Vulnerable, first of all, almost 1.5 billion people around the world they are smallholder farmers. And these smallholder farmers are giving us 70 or 80% of our food that locally we eat right now. But if you go to Africa or Asia, local food producers, sometimes 90% are responsible, but these people are the most vulnerable food insecure because they are basically subsistence farmers or little fisher folks. They have no power against economic volatility, conflict, or uh, climate, uh, uh, climate oriented natural disasters. If everything goes well, we don't need maybe right to food because we will have all food security. But unfortunately, the way in which we are living in this world right now in 21st century, the, all the disasters comes one after another. So in the disaster period, what is this responsibility of the state? In disaster period, responsibility of the state is positive, which means they have to maintain the food system that people would get enough food not to starve. But this is only for emergency period. If there is no emergency, state is not responsible to give you a food. This is not a right to food, but state is responsible to establish a system that you will be able to produce your own food while accessing the resources, the productive resources, land, water, seeds, and you have to have an objective and indiscriminatory system that everyone can access this. And also, it's a very important that uh, you don't have to produce your own food. If you are not a food producer, for instance, you are a city dweller, living city, you have to have a job. You have to have a social protection system that you will be able to feed yourself or and your family consistently because food security sometimes not consistent. You are food secure this month, but the next, next month you lost your job, which is COVID-19 showed us. Now, in the United States, 20 million people lost their job. 
So the all the food banks right now is dealing with these people, miles after miles line the, in front of the food banks to get the food. But so you can't think, oh my God, this is the most richest country in the world, how possible? Yes, because the system is not established kind of accountability. You don't, if you don't have a social security, if you don't have an unemployment insurance, if you don't have any other, uh, for instance, you get sick, if you don't have a, a health insurance, you are completely on your own. So if the human rights based system would be there, that things would be legally uh, applicable and available. So that's a kind of uh, issues is important. So if we talk about it, why hunger is increasing, there are major reasons which FAO uh, wrote several of reports since 2016, because since 2015 or 16, every year we have more and more and more hungry people. Now we are around 821 million people completely uh, uh, under, under secured or um, uh, not, not able to feed themselves. And more than 2 billion people, that's a very serious, it's malnutrition problem. So malnutrition problem is becoming more serious than ever before. And also malnutrition is a difficult concept because they are not, you are not hungry, but there's a malnutrition issues. So uh, hungry, 821 million people completely hungry, but 2 billion people are uh, suffering from malnutrition. When we talk about the malnutrition, also that's an important problem to know. It's not only a malnutrition like in children are wasting and uh, uh, not having a wasting and stunting system under nutrition, what we call, but there is also overnutrition. Overnutrition is a wrong concept. I think malnutrition is better, which is obesity, which means uh, you eat food, you eat a lot of food, but the wrong food, the food that is in the supermarket. So the food that is not healthy. It, and this is also interesting, hunger and malnutrition. Hunger is basically the problem of the developing countries and the least developed countries, but uh, malnutrition is universal. Uh, when we say universal, United States, 60% of people overweight or uh, obese. That's a significant amount of people. They have a food, they eat food, but they eat junk food. So that kind of problems that I have seen during the six years of uh, my uh, special reportership, which I haven't seen when it, it's when I was writing this first article. So climate change was definitely there. Industrial agricultural problems was definitely there. Environmental problems were definitely there in 2014 when I started. But then during my special reportage, what I found is starvation and famine is significant issue. COVID-19 pandemic disaster is a significant issue, which I learned in my uh, time. So in my final report, I put six, seven important problems that I, I didn't anticipate, but I saw, I experienced. The one is was the important, and we know all of us, and in 2014 was also the case. The, the first is, the uh, globalization and commodification of food system is an important problem, which means food systems right now, uh, starting from 1980s, late, uh, late 80s and 1990s, uh, become uh, under the influence of the neoliberal economy and become commodification rather than just having a food 
to nourish yourself, it become trade and investment issue. Trade and investment issue, of course, brought maybe lucrative business and availability become so strong for many of the food uh, production, which right now we talk about the 821 million people are hungry, but we have uh, left over, or uh, we have uh, uh, more food than we need right now. And uh, we are able to feed the world uh, almost 13 billion people with our available food system right now like that you know there is no availability problem the uh, industrial agriculture increased incredibly more than necessary food production which affect of course uh, environmental problems so globalization and commodification of food system is number one problem the second one is marginalization marginalization of the smallholder farmers marginalization of the peasants, indigenous peoples, and women. These are marginalized groups that they lost their uh, role in the global food system. They diminished, they, uh, they squeezed under the bigger uh, kind of uh, basically few big corporations, which oligopolic system of the food corporations. Another issue is resource looting. Resource looting, which is plundering of the land and water and seeds. These are very important things. For instance, land grabbing, we keep talking about. Significant problem in Asia and Africa, even in Europe. So that is a land grabbing, which big time corporations are going to developing countries that basically property rights are not strong. So the kind of community-based com common property is very easy to access if the government if, uh, do the deal with the big corporations. So land grabbing, comes with the water grabbing. Of course, water is the major resource for uh, food production. And seeds become a lucrative material rather than a farmer's uh, kind of uh, a very important sources that they can exchange with each other. That become monopolized and protected by the uh, also um, copyrights, right? And then becomes this pollutions and uh, the loss of biodiversity. Pollutions, loss of biodiversity, climate change, it become more and more bigger problem because more you produce, more you use pesticides, more you, uh, you loss of biodiversity, more you lose water, pollute the water. Oceans already uh, have a significant loss in terms of uh, fishing industry. And then at the, uh, the, the last one is supermarketization of our system. This big industrial corporations become kind of taking over all um, food chain from uh, table uh, from the farm to table they try to control entire production uh, chain then they uh, become a monolithic uh, food system wherever you go which country you go which country enter the supermarket you see the same food and this same food are generally very dangerous that creates malnutrition because uh, they are uh, mo mostly um, long live shelf life uh, uh, food, which is uh, more sugar, more salt, and saturated fat. These are the foods and extremely cheap. For instance, in the United States, uh, you can buy organic apple one organic apple and one uh, MacBook hamburger is the same price. So the poor people, what they're gonna do with their children to feed their children, of course they get the hamburger rather than one 
only one organic apple. That's a very serious issue. So this become inequality issue, which means if we are rich enough, if we are wealthy enough, we eat perfectly fine and we find everything. We have no food insecurity problem and the better food. But if we are not um, financially strong, then we will not be able to feed them, ourselves and our children. That become a very issue with poverty and inequality. So without solving the poverty and inequality issues, we're not gonna get rid of the hunger and malnutrition. So that's why, why we have lots of available food, but not enough people that are food secure. So that's a, this is not no brainer. In order you, to understand this, you don't have to be a special rapporteur, but you have to just to look at the system. So what I am trying to do in this report, what we should do that uh, this uh, unjust system should be changed. In every report, we have the recommendations. And I have the recommendation in the final uh, uh, report, which is the first, of course, easy way. We have to recognize right to foot in our constitution. For instance, if you look at the covenants, international covenants, 170 countries accepting them ratified, but only around 30 countries put their right to put in their constitution. This is not acceptable. So more countries should be implicitly and explicitly include the right to put their constitution. If we can't do this, we didn't do our job. So we have to push. The other one, uh, other recommendation, as I said before, human rights based approach, which means we need some kind of procedural rights to put in our legal system that citizens should be able to question their, country, their state. State obligations should be regulated. Participation in the decision making should be there. It has to be open. We have to know what decisions are taken by the governments and they have to be accountability. And justice system should be uh, perfectly worked. These are very, very difficult things, but we have to do it. So we need economic reform. We should adopt the economic reform. We can't, but we are, what we are doing, completely opposite. We get rid of uh, many of the social security because of austerity measures. You know, austerity measures in Europe, not only in uh, developing countries. Austerity measures were lost in England, in France, and Spain, in uh, Greece, in Turkey, many places. So because the free market doesn't like austerity measures. So that's uh, important. We should really deal with the social security system. So we should give a power to civil society. Civil society should raise their voice they, because they are the people uh, understanding this, the bad uh, or uh, not correct policy decision. So uh, we have to finance human rights institutions. Without the finance human rights institution, we are not going to under, understand what is going on. And also we have to uh, implement some legal system in international level, which make the extraterritorial violations uh, uh, kind of uh, punitive. Extraterritorial ter violations means the companies, for instance, European companies go to Africa, they do uh, some kind of business that the ordinary people, local people lose their uh, land, land grabbing. So we should go after this uh, foreign um, companies in their own capitals. So uh, the states are reluctant to accept this, but many NGOs are pushing this. What we call business and human rights issues is very important. Uh, there is a committee in Geneva, they work on that, but the establishing an international uh, uh, agreement is extremely uh, difficult. So 
uh, another, the final thing, is we really have to respect scientific integrity. Scientific integrity is extremely important, especially in relation to using pesticides and chemicals or genetically, genetically modified organisms and bringing alternative uh, agricultural uh, production systems like agroecology, we need to listen uh, scientific uh, um, voices. Uh, let me stop here. I think I talk more than necessary and I'm ready any kind of uh, questions that if you want me to go further in any area. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Hilal, um, really for this excellent overview, um, not simply about um, just the right to food, but your experience as a UN Special Rapporteur. I think uh, many people, many of our members of our academy may not fully have understood what a Special Rapporteur does. Uh, and I know from knowing you, the amount of work that goes into it. Um, before I make some comments, we do have one question from uh, Robert. Um, and his is more trying to understand uh, the methodology for calculating the figure of, one, of 821 million hungry persons, but it is a large figure. Um, so where does this come from, uh, these sources? Okay. okay. Uh, th that is, uh, uh, this uh, calculation is FAO has a kind of rules and principles to make the hunger people. Uh, in order to do that, I think uh, they, uh, they look at the one person in one day, how much calorie they needed, which is I think 2,400 calorie you need for a day for a healthy person. And, but this is, uh, and then they calculate this calorie with the how much available food we have. So that is a kind of strange way of calculation because these people should be non-working sedentary person, first of all, 2,400. And they, they don't make any kind of disaggregated uh, data. For instance, uh, in the family, internal family, um, basically there's a big difference between women and men and children. Men get the best food, the bigger food, and women are uh, second, and sometimes women are not second, children and the women. So we can't really make a decent kind of calculation about the uh, 800, uh, the, the real uh, hunger. So that's a conceptual issue. Basically, of course, the hunger, uh, this uh, record basically in Africa and the highest level of the um, hungry people, not Africa, in Asia, because Asia is, much, Asia is much more crowded. But at the same time, compared to ratio population and the hungry people, um, Sub-Saharan Africa very, very high compared to South Asia. And also, the, the basic uh, uh, policies in South Asian countries, successful China, and Vietnam made significant decrease of the hungry people, but at the same time in other uh, regions um, increased. So it depends on which region you are talking about. FAO has a specific report about every region, more detailed understanding. So, but it is very important to put a, a one figure to make people shaken. So the 821, I never believe the right thing to say, but at least, even, but the safe story is even more than this. It's not less. So that's the question. That's the answer. Yeah, that's, and I have, just to add something, when you mentioned about women, I myself, and I won't say where, <laughs> witnessed where the men eat first and the women eat later and what's left over. So yeah. I think the point you raise about this gender differentiation in nutrition is important. But um, we have, so first there's a hand raised by Giacomo, and then there's a question from Mark. So Giacomo, why don't you turn your, uh, show yourself, maybe you're there, 
and you can ask your question to Professor Eller. Yes, thank you very much for giving me the floor and also for this interesting lecture. Um, I still have two questions concerning an issue you already indicated. Um, it is about um, yeah, the, 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 the way um, our international economic system works and the interconnection with um, food security. So one thing that I'm interested about is um, in how far are there initiatives to change, for example, um, I don't know, international trade law or international intellectual property law in order to make it um, easier to distribution. And the second question, which is somehow connected with it, um, if we talk about um, the, the right to food uh, and we look at how international business works, um, shouldn't we also um, start to think um, about the way yeah, we can weigh different human rights because we also have recognized the, the rights to uh, the right to property as a human right. So we also have some kind of a weighting between the right uh, to property and to possession and the rights to food maybe in the future. And shouldn't we also rethink um, in, in how far we weigh different human rights in specific situations? Because this seems to me like where um, um, a, a recreation of the international economic system is also headed. Well, the, come from the your fine uh, the the last question about uh, right to property. Uh, right to property is legal right, but it is not a human right. So we have to make a distinction between the legal rights and the human rights. So human rights are much more conceptual. Uh, for instance, uh, you can, uh, if we really respect all these rights and legal rights, maybe there will not be any problem about the human rights. But unfortunately, depending on capitalism uh, or economic order, um, as you said, the property rights comes first than the people's human rights. I talk about the, for instance, land grabbing, okay? Uh, land grabbing, very important uh, because many of the countries don't have a clear property rights for the land. So uh, if there is a, a, a investors come uh, from outside and the leader of the a country, uh, make an agreement to this particular land or the chief of the village. Sometimes village chief, you know, in Africa, the, the some property rights belong to the state, some property, smaller versions are the village chief. I saw many places in Africa. So people that living there have no right to say anything because they don't have a property right, but their violations of human rights are significantly violated. So that's why if we, as a human rights defender, we have to protect first uh, human rights if the property rights directly uh, attack to and unjustly attack people's human rights. Of course, property rights will be definitely protected if there is no violation of human rights. We all have our pro property rights that we would like to uh, protect and we would like to defend. But while we are defending our property rights, we should not interfere other people's rights. So one person's right ends, the other person's right starts. You know, that's always, uh, we have to share a certain kind of uh, economic system or the property system. So that's a that's a complicated uh, answer to your complicated question because it's a big deal. So if we come to um, international trade off, yeah, one of the major issues uh, dealing with the uh, world trade system, how to protect food security and food safety. Uh, uh, for instance, if we talk about this major um, trade agreements, it, it didn't happen, but it was United States and Europe, there was a trade agreements. In this trade agreements, basically, 
um, more likely corporate oriented. If there is a, uh, for instance, a disagreement, uh, there is a special uh, system, arbitration system, to solve the problem rather than real courts. And even in the real courts, what is the power of the big corporations and the power of the people? So there is no way you can really strongly protect your right. And also, because of the uh, making trade much more effective and freely, uh, regulations are going down, down, down all the way. For instance, uh, you have to compromise the labor rights, you have to compromise environmental rights, you have to compromise people's uh, human rights in order to make the trade more lucrative. So you have to really balance between safety, food safety, for instance, um, there was a problem between US and the, uh, Europe, uh, the hormonal meats. So US doesn't mind uh, meat, with hormone, uh, growth hormone, but you, uh, Europe doesn't want to accept this. So then they have to make the compromise, whether or not these uh, rules are against the uh, free market system. So WTO, World Trade Organization, is uh, doing something, but World Trade Organization is dealing with if there is no bilateral, multilateral trade agreement. If there's a multilateral, bilateral trade agreement, World Trade Organization system is there, but you have to have a good negotiation power to protect your people, to protect your environment, to protect your uh, work uh, system. So all about uh, how strong and powerful your economy is or how you want to be a part of the global economic order. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Albert. We're running out of time, but we have still some questions. So we're going to go a little bit over time. Um, there's a question from Marcus and then Evgeny and Dion and one comment from Takao. So very quickly, uh, Marcus, uh, thank you, Professor. This is a very interesting and informative lecture. I think the right to food is something which would receive broad acceptance. When hunger is so widespread, would it be a bit too optimistic to try to also address the type of food uh, that those who have food should be eating? How do we deal with the choices people want in terms of what they consume? So, Yes, there is a certain kind of uh, freedom of choice, right? Uh, a more libertarian view, we have to choose what we can eat, what we should eat. But at the same time, we have to consider the health consequences. First of all, culturally acceptable food is part of the right to food because you cannot really give people that they uh, religious or cult culturally are not um, able to consume this, right? For instance, uh, in Muslim countries, if you uh, give a kind of certain amount of meat, they're not able to eat this. So the cultural acceptance is extremely important. Regional uh, acceptance is very important, but at the same time, there must be some kind of rules and principles about the health situation because if we completely make free, let's say, oh, people are hungry uh, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, just give them a junk food. And then what happens, uh, non-communicable diseases uh, comes with this uh, lots of consumption of the junk food. So non-communicable diseases, which means diabetes, heart disease, cancer, hypertension, these are the 70% of the reason of death. So we have to be really careful and make it clear decision about what kind of food we are giving, even that significantly the hunger problem is significant to that. So it is a possible how to food could be cheaper. Yeah, thank you. I think, 
think we could talk quite a bit on the subject. Actually, it's 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 fascinating. But we'll go on. Uh, Evgenia, um, she has a question about whether there have been any attempt litigation and human rights bodies coming to mind to enforce the right to food internationally, not domestically, or any international disputes on this. Uh, or whether the right to food was invoked separately or in conjunction with other rights, just the yeah. right to to life, and if so, what remedies were claimed and were they granted? Yeah. Well, a uh, very good question, actually, if, because it's very important. Uh, in my report, I put some of the, the first first article writing and also last report. And also my first report in the uh, Human Rights Council, the, the subject matter I sort of push on the just justiciability of the right to food because we are talking about human rights system, we are talking about accountability without looking at what kind what is happening in the courts so it is extremely important i would recommend you if you are working on this issue you read my first human rights council report so judicial decisions is very important it could be either there is a, a explicit uh, constitutional uh, principles that will be in domestic law and there's also international uh, decision, but only regional, uh, for instance, African region, have two decisions uh, about one is Nigeria, the other one is in Kenya on the right to put. But the domestic decision, Colombia Constitutional Court is important. South Africa is a very good decision, Supreme Court, about the protection of the smallholder, small scale fisheries. And El Salvador about uh, pre, uh, Guatemala is the uh, people's malnutritious people. And El Salvador, as far as I remember, the prison food. And there are uh, cases directly, as you know, if there is no explicit uh, uh, provision, you can go ahead with right to life because every constitution have a right to life uh, type of um, provision, it's possible to go to court if you have a, a more uh, kind of sympathetic judge. So that's important. Indian court decision was very important around the world because these are in 2001 is a strategic um, court decision that NGOs and uh, unions, uh, worker unions went to court because there was a, available food in the warehouses, but people were starving. So that made the in Indian food, uh, right to food system quite formidable. So uh, Brazil, for instance, is a very good uh, right to food um, constitution uh, rule uh, during the Lula period, but you have to understand the politics can change. Right now in Brazil, unfortunately, uh, law by law, the new leader is changing. A right to food is uh, not as important as Lula period. So you have to change the law, you have to put the law, and you have to keep the law. The next uh, president could completely throw out of this system. So that's a, it's a very political decision, but there are cases. But having said that, I wouldn't say right to food is significantly uh, active in the uh, courtroom. This is not yet there. We are not yet there. Okay, thank you. One last question, and then there'll be one comment as well. This is from Dion. Um, thank you for the lecture. Is there any best practice about the implementation of right to food you can recommend that could be used in developing countries? And are there standards we can use to say whether the right to food within the state is fulfilled or not? Well, of course, uh, as I said, Brazil is an excellent example. They, uh, they made uh, these changes very recently during the Lula period. And it's a good example, still there, despite changes. And also South African constitution is very good. There are many countries actually uh, made a good law. And um, uh, also FAO has uh, 
this uh, voluntary guidelines about right to food, 2004. This 2004 voluntary gu guidelines of FAO uh, make the right to food principles how to make it. For instance, I am a, a minister of agriculture in a country and I want to make it good uh, kind of national law and framework law, I go look at the 2004 voluntary guidelines of the right to food. They put all the rules and principles, how can we implement good system, good, good institutional structure, good legal um, uh, uh, provisions, and the uh, how to make um, access to justice without sometimes even going to court because there is an easy way without going to court. You can also solve uh, problems in the ministerial level because especially in the least developed countries, it's very costly to right to go to court. And also many people don't know even their rights, whether or not what they have. So uh, especially again, I talk about the women. Uh, women are laid behind to go to court to, uh, to protect their rights. So uh, the, the rules and principles there, the, for instance, Cuba is a very good example. Nicaragua is a very good example. Basically, Latin American countries are uh, very successful. Uh, there was a parliamentarian committee of the Latin American countries that supporting the right to put in domestic level. And also this Latin American countries started to cooperate with the African countries. That was a very good South to South cooperation. And they discussed and they all documented. It's a very easy to find a good uh, kind of models. Still not many court cases. Uh, still, do you think that because of this um, laws and principles, we solve the uh, hunger problem? Of course not, because implementation is very important. Giving the financial support to this institution is very important. If there is no budget to the law that gives you a perfect system, you can't do anything. It, it has to be all together. One of the problems of economic, social, cultural rights progressive realization of the rights. Maybe you listened uh, yesterday in, in your uh, class with your professors, progressive realization of economic social rights gives the countries possibility to give excuse because we don't have an economic power, we don't have an institutional power, so we like to implement, but we can't. That is the excuse, uh, unfortunately, acceptable. Thank you so much. And just one uh, last comment from Tikao, who thanks you as well for your lecture. And she offers uh, a link to the 2020 FAO SDG progress report, which echoes your presentation and points. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tikao. And I think we can all thank uh, Professor Elver. You really um, gave us an extremely interesting um, insights into an area that many of us may not be so aware of. And yet what you're telling us is that we're looking at a situation where extreme hunger and famine is actually in the future. So on the one, but the good news is that the World Food Program is recognized with a Nobel yeah. Peace Prize. Uh, so let's put food, let's put right to food on our agenda. And, and thank you so much uh, for joining us and taking the time from Bodrum. <laughs> and we hope you'll come back and visit the Academy again. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for all the questions that I am very much uh, interested in this chat because there are very good questions, very good points. And it would be helpful for me too to develop more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful. And tomorrow, uh, we look forward to the second part of Professor Pazarzi's lecture on human rights. And so see you all tomorrow. Good. See you tomorrow. And if you'd like to access the recording of this lecture, it will be available on the CIL Facebook page and YouTube channel. Those of you in the E-Academy, see you tomorrow in class. Goodbye. <laughs>